Uh, I'm going to introduce Kelly Yarns, who has done yeoman's work in terms of setting up the lecture series this, um, this spring, and uh, it's really a dynamite group of speakers, uh, excluding myself, of course. Uh, so, uh, so, Kelly, tell us some more. Oh, what did you want me to talk about? Well, the various things. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do, and how, who the co-sponsors are for the lecture series. Right. Um, yeah, so my name is Kelly Yarns, and I'm a program coordinator for Global Public Health Minor. Um, about myself, I am a graduate of the University of Montana. I graduated with a degree in economics and minors in math and uh, international development studies. We didn't have global public health at the time. I have a long connection with health in general. My people, my parents were all nurses and doctors and nurses and a doctor and, and uh, I have pursued more alternative directions with herbal medicine and that kind of thing and massage therapy. Um, uh, so this is a minor for those of you who are students. Um, if you want more information about the minor, it's not a lot of credits required, and I highly recommend you visit with Peter or myself if you're interested in learning more about what the minor offers. We have a lot of really cool stuff besides the lecture series. We have an internship program. We have some funding to help support um, students who are enrolled in the minor who um, take on unpaid internships. So there's an opportunity to actually get some money from us to support your working for free for someone else. Um, and the scholarships? And we have uh, a scholarship available, the Peter Kern and Phyllis Nagai scholarship, and then our external advisory committee supports a lot of what Global Public Health does. So we get funding through the university, but we also get a lot of funding just from the community. Um, which is really great. But they also offer a $500 a year award to support some sort of experiential learning experience. So if you sign up for an international internship that requires you to be you are eligible for that. But you could also apply it towards um, local projects as long as they're experiential in nature. Um, one other thing that Peter talked about today, this is Peter's new book and his talk is going to be about this, but he was um, donated this copy of the book um, for us to give away. And I think that the way we're going to do it is every time you sign up as a community member, um, we'll put your name or, in the hat. Or as a student. Or as a student, we'll put your name in the hat. So the more lectures you come to, the more times your name is in the hat, and then we have a spring celebration which everybody is invited to come to and we'll draw a name out of the hat then. So it will be important for you to sign in and give me your email address um, so that we can follow through with that. So that's kind of fun. Um, anything else? Yeah, I hate to tell you this because I'd love to sell some more copies of the book, but it's $120. Uh, wow. So it's a pretty, pretty nice uh, raffle, uh, raffle gift if you get it. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about that, so you'll, you'll hear about that frequently. Um, so, okay, thanks, Kelly. Oh, and our co-sponsor. So yeah. um, the Institute for, of Health and Humanities um, is a co-sponsor, and they have donated a, a, a portion of the support for this lecture series, which has been really awesome, and it's really allowed us to reach a lot more people with our promotion. and and you know, to make fancy, shiny posters that we can hang up in places. So um, always thanks to the IHH. So it, I'm not going to go into the whole program. Kelly's got programs for you, or you can find it online on the Global Public Health Lecture Series. But it's really a dynamite uh, uh, set of speakers. And we have people coming, at least three speakers that I know of, who have done work in Africa are going to be coming to speak to us this, this semester. Uh, we've got two people from ACROS that are doing work in uh, Zambia. Uh, we have Lisa Parks, uh, the uh, MacArthur Genius Fellow who graduated from the University of Montana, talking about some of her work with high-tech stuff in Africa. Uh, we have Brianna Barger, my former student, who's a family doc in Spokane right now, and she's going to come over and talk about the project that she's developed on her own in Mali uh, with, uh, with physicians who are Malian physicians there. 
Well, that's just a uh, that's just a uh, enticement, a little bit of uh, special interest. But there's a lot of other good talks coming up as well. And next week we're going to have uh, Kevin, the Peace Corps recruiter on campus, talk about what it's like uh, to work in the health field in the Peace Corps. <clears throat> that's something that's of great interest, I think, to many of you as well. <clears throat> Um, so tonight, uh, I have the opportunity to give the kickoff lecture, and I'm, I'm quite excited to do this because it's a subject that's very dear to my heart. Um, and I'll start out by saying that um, at least one billion people today uh, who are tourists cross one or more national borders annually. And more than 230 million transnational migrants impact health and health care provision around the world. The uh, film critic Manola Darges has perceptively remarked that ours is an age of ceaseless churn with no end in sight. So my new book, Transnational Mobility and Global Health, Traversing Borders and Boundaries, spotlight, spotlights the intersections of human movement, especially migration, and health. Hopefully the perspective of a political scientist can illuminate uh, and uh, be mobilizing regarding this contemporary issue because the morbidity and mortality associated with migration health are connected directly or indirectly to local, national, and international political decisions. This evening, what I'd like to do is to extract three positions that are developed, analyzed, and documented in far greater detail in my book. So I call these my three fives. Uh, and first, they are to illustrate five ways that mobility and global health are linked, then to identify five cross-cutting and overlapping dynamics that influence each of these other linkages, and then conclude with five take-home messages for tomorrow's public health professionals that flow from the prior analysis. So the first of these five ways that mobility and global health are linked uh, is actually chapter one in the book. And it has to do with patient mobility for health reasons, or AKA health tourism. A conservative estimate holds that some five million international patients per year are engaged in health tourism, and they generate an estimate market value of $2.5 billion in treatment expenditures. The appealing services, health services, that, uh, that are available in southern countries include dentistry, cosmetic surgery, cardiology, orthopedics, and ophthalmology. Northern patients are inspired to seek service abroad by multiple and diverse motivators, including the high costs and the long waits that they face in their home country. Surgery costs in South Africa, for example, can be as little as one-third of the price charged in London. Transplant and open-heart surgeries, as well as knee and hip replacements in India, can be secured for 10% or less of the cost for similar treatment here in the USA. Wealth is a key contributor to the unequal mobilities that govern transnational health tourism. The numbers of wealthy and well-connected transnational care seekers are growing. And many of these are coming from countries in the global south, particularly from the Middle East and from China. Roughly half a million citizens of China traveled internationally for medical treatment in 2016. Anecdotally, many health tourists report positive experiences. And I guess I could put myself in that position as well. I didn't really go abroad for this, but I was abroad. And this was during the SARS epidemic, and I happened to find myself in Hong Kong, where the SARS virus broke out. Um, I, f I was there at a conference, and I had just left behind Missoula after having an, uh, an operation to remove my appendix. Well, I got an infection in my, in my operate where I had the operation. And so I had to decide whether or not to go to the hospital 
and seek treatment for my infection and risk getting SARS. Uh, because the thing that SARS did first and foremost was to, uh, was to affect the uh, healthcare providers, doctors and nurses. It's a very high mortality rate in Hong Kong. Uh, well, I suffered as long as I could and I went to the hospital where my kids were born and everything turned out all right or I wouldn't be here right now. So um, that was a positive experience for me. Um, but medical tourism is not a panacea. It can promise hope but deliver despair. Um, even successful ventures, uh, even in the case of successful ventures, continuity of care upon return to the country of origin often becomes challenging, complicated, and compromised, and there's usually no records that you bring back with you when you do this kind of thing. So a couple of pictures here. This shows you how attractive health tourism can be, especially in the Montana winter. Uh, doesn't that look good? Uh, you'll be going to a place very similar to that soon. Uh, and then here's an example of uh, uh, an ad for cosmetic dentistry in, in India. You can find almost any procedure in India, uh, but it's important to remember that health tourism is quite competitive today across the globe, both in the north and in the south. So India doesn't have a, a lock on the market, although I think when I Google, for example, health tourism, more Indian sites come up than any other place. Um, and then um, some price comparisons for you. Uh, if you can see these, Mexico, Cuba, India, Singapore, Malaysia, for things like hip replacement, knee replacement, nose jobs, tummy tucks, and so forth. Um, so you can see what I, kind of reinforces the point I was making about the costs tend to be a lot lower. <clears throat> In the book, I also draw attention to the impact of health tourism on population care in southern treatment countries. In most southern cases, the expansion of transnational health tourism has diverted limited domestic financial and personnel resources from health services needed by most local residents. Um, in, uh, instead of engaging in pre uh, preventive community health, and treating local populations that have infectious diseases, primary care needs, or chronic conditions, many trained health workers in places like Thailand and India elect to attend to the needs of richer medical tourists. Too often, medical tourism encourages the development of two-tiered health systems within which technologically sophisticated hospitals cater to foreign patients and stand beside poorly resourced public hospitals. So I picked this as an example of a um, poorly resourced uh, regional hospital uh, in Kasumi in, in, um, in Kenya. Um, you know, Nancy Fitch, uh, who is a uh, member of our external advisory committee and has devoted the last 10 years of her life now uh, to working around the world in terms in in public health. She often works at clinics like this and hospitals like this uh, in Africa. And I think, you know, many of the contributions of people who have been part of this lecture series in the past or are going to be giving lectures this, uh, this spring uh, will fall into the same category. They're working not at the uh, most expensive and high-tech kinds of places around the world, but they're working in remote areas and in places like this that need their help the most. So moving on from health tourism to a more sensitive and, um, um, and distressing topic, and that is the health consequences of dislocation in the face of armed conflict, whether that be targeted conflict or incidental conflict. Armed conflict is gaining recognition as a daunting public health issue. UNHCR's 2016 Global Trends Report alerts us that, quote, more people are on the run than ever before in recorded history. The vast majority of the victims of contemporary armed conflict are civilians today, increasingly in what Mary Caldor calls the new warfare, military operations by all parties to an armed conflict intentionally target civilians. 
An estimated 11.5% of Syria's population had been killed or injured by 2015. Imagine that. One, more than one out of every 10 people in Syria killed as a result of armed conflict. Um, that's clearly a daunting public health issue. In 2017 alone, more than 10,000 children were killed or maimed in armed conflict, according to a UN report. So I, I pulled this shot because it, 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 it touched me, uh, about a micro-level kind of photo of, a civi of civilian consequences. In this particular case, uh, there was an airstrike on a rebel-held neighborhood in Aleppo in Syria in 2016. And these brave men were trying to save someone who was severely injured in that airstrike. But again, all of them are civilians. And the United States is not blameless in this regard. Uh, here's a December 2018 report that shows that the CIA and its Afghan allies have led a trail of abuse and anger primarily directed at civilians. And that usually causes a negative reaction towards uh, towards this country. Um, if it wasn't bad enough that civilians were targeted, what's become even worse is that international destruction of medical facilities is occurring with ever greater for frequency as combatants increasingly target health services in conflict zones. This is all part of what is called a total war strategy. So instead of respecting the hospitals, they're actually uh, targeted so that uh, there will be less, um, uh, less support for the, uh, for the people in that, for the populations in that area. Uh, just to give you one particularly egregious example, um, about 65% of Yemen's health facilities have been damaged by the civil war in that country. And that has meant that more than 14 million people have not been able to get health care in Yemen. And even more disturbing maybe, or equally disturbing, is the fact that the safety of medical personnel under international humanitarian law is no longer respected by combatants. And then there is the incidental damage associated with armed conflict and the remnants of war. Uh, and these, these incidental damages often negatively affect population health. Landmines would come to mind. Uh, in January of 2017, for instance, the deliberate targeting of Damascus, Damascus's water supply infrastructure resulted in a health-impairing water crisis. In the throngs of armed conflict, food needed for people's sustenance is destroyed or diverted and looted the resulting chronic and acute malnutrition increases risks of morbidity and mortality. And this particular shot uh, goes back to the destruction of medical facilities. This is the remains of the Al Shefa Hospital in Aleppo that suffered a target. It's a little dark. You can it's completely collapsed right here. Um, that uh, targeted airstrike in 2012. It's understandable that many people opt to flee from armed conflicts and repressive gov governments that threaten one's personal and family health and their lives. Most conflict-displaced immigrants or migrants do not leave the global south, but are separated from their support networks and from whatever rudimentary place of origin health care they might have had. For survivors, the road ahead is paved with peril. An African war zone study carried out by Physicians for Human Rights concluded that the first killer is flight for desperately poor persons who are driven from a, by a conflict from a fragile existence into a hostile and personally threatening environment. And in this environment, health services often are non-existent or destroyed and not functioning. Special mortality and morbidity hazards are associated with undocumented migrants and irregular migrants, as well as those who are smuggled or trafficked. And also, we shouldn't forget about tortured captive terrorist suspects. 
Conditions often are at most marginally better for survivors who reach a camp or reside in a spontaneous settlement or a detention center. Crowding and poor sanitary conditions compound the risk of illness and death from debilitating communicable diseases, especially for children. Mental health also is problematic. Migrants can survive torture, persecution, and repression in the home country only to encounter the equally powerful trauma of exile, loss, insecurity, and discrimination in their place of refuge, as well as the fear of deportation, which can be extremely traumatic. So a couple of shots here to give you some idea of the lay of the land. Uh, this is a, a massive Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. It's the size of a, one of the biggest cities now in Jordan. Um, and here, two close-ups from the Adomi camp uh, in, in Greece. Uh, this is a close-up of one tent with a lot of litter and other kinds of problems around. And this is what the bigger picture looks like. <coughs> Sorry, this is dark. A sewer line, a sewer, open sewer running right through the camp with the kids playing in it. Um, All right, third, few conflict displaced persons make it to the global north. The figure is about 0.5% of all refugees actually make it to the global north. So most refugees then are living in places like that camp in Jordan in, in the global south where countries are already hard pressed to provide for their own populations. Refugees and others from southern places of origin who make it to the north present a third mobility health connection. That is, stranger or unmatched provider-patient encounters. In these situations, the medical interview holds the potential to either undermine inequalities or to reproduce them. Ethical human encounters bridge the gulf between us and them. Throughout the North, health workers increasingly engage with health users in spatial transition from a multitude of dissimilar nation states or ethnic communities. And we have that right here in Missoula. And uh, Rachel LaRocca, who has given one of the lectures in this lecture series, is a doctor who works with refugees from multiple places. Um, and it's quite challenging, as she pointed out in her lecture. In transnational consultations, clinicians and patients often must deal with a wide variety of unfamiliar health threats and the multi-dimensional nature of human experience generates considerable variation and complexity even within particular ethnic groups. This conundrum calls for what I have labeled transnational competence, or TC for short, on the part of providers and care recipients. TC has five dimensions, analytic, emotional, creative, communicative, and functional. My Fulbright New Century Scholar research in Finland found that few nurses and even fewer doctors are transnationally competent. This shortcoming has serious consequences for patient satisfaction, compliance with recommended protocols, and awareness of complementary or transnational care practices. And in that research, I found that those doctors uh, and nurses who were transnationally competent had uh, advantageous outcomes. So this last point, awareness of complementary or transnational care, uh, that's very important because migrants who have recently or maybe even after a few years left tend to continue to use some of the traditional uh, medicines that they use in the past and continue to be in contact with healthcare providers uh, in their home country and still use some of those kinds of, uh, of things. So in my study, I tried to find out um, by asking, it was a three-part study, I, I interviewed doctors, nurses, and patients. So I asked the patients, first of all, uh, to what extent they used ethnocultural practices. And then I asked the doctors, how, how, did this, how often does this patient use ethnocultural practices? And you can see the result here is, that only 23% of them knew the right answer. 
um, 26% underestimated, 25% overestimated how much they used complementary or traditional practices, and about another fourth said, I just don't know, I have no idea. Um, so uh, less than one fourth being accurate is not a very high, and the TC doctors did a little bit better. Um, so uh, this slide shows, uh, I'm not going to read the whole slide, I'll let you look at it, but I think that the point of this slide is that measures that bring about greater sensitivity and equity in the treatment of migrant patients are in the national <coughs> interest of receiving countries for the reasons that I set forth in this particular slide. So they're in the interest of the patient, of course, too, but in the interest of the country that receives migrants as well. <clears throat> so one further critically important dimension of professional TC is referrals and strategic advocacy. It's not enough to treat the symptoms of conflict and inequity. Practitioners also need to address underlying contributors of migrant ill health. And here I'm talking about the social and political determinants that too often are overlooked by caregivers. The challenge of functional competence that public health professionals face involves reversing the vicious cycle so that health becomes a promising bridge to peace rather than a negative consequence of conflict. Engagement by medical personnel in peacemaking, conflict resolution, and post-conflict rest restoration initiatives when they're in the field constitutes a promising pathway to forestalling violence and preventing dire health consequences. And I, I'm happy to say that physicians for social responsibility understand this. Um, So I'm going to move on now to the fourth uh, point that I wanted to raise in terms of what the book covers. Chapter six of the book is called Pathogens Without Borders, and it's devoted to the spread of emerging and re-emerging diseases. Mobility is the common denominator that advances uh, pathogens, most frequently across contiguous borders within the global south. Occasionally, that, that'll spread to the north, but most frequently we're talking about contiguous borders in the global south. In 2014, for example, Ebola spread primarily throughout the West African countries of Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. Today, new Ebola out there's a new Ebola outbreak, and that is in a hot spot of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, and it happens to be a spot that's plagued by the kind of uh, violence civilian, uh, affecting civilians that I talked about earlier. Um, it's a, uh, str a place where t civilians are being targeted by the kinds of violence that's going on in that part of, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And it threatens that Ebo the Ebola virus threatens to spill over uh, into Uganda and Rwanda because there's frequent cross-border movement for trade among these countries. Lessons from the SARS and Ebola crises, including early case identification, rapid and comprehensive contact tracing, improved protection for health care workers, and rapid personnel and resource mobilization are treated in Chapter 6 and were mentioned by uh, Kate Hurley and George Risi in lectures that they've given as part of this lecture series because they were out there during the Ebola crisis uh, right on the front lines. Along with efforts to limit the global spread of infections by travelers and migrants, the feasibility of quarantines, isolation, and social exclusion in a mobility-driven world also receives attention in that chapter. So I'm going to just show you a couple of things here. First of all, here's what the uh, Ebola virus looks like under the scope. And here's a, an example of a a quarantine that was uh, put in place in Liberia um, during the Ebola outbreak of 2014. Uh, um, and, um, and this, this uh, quarantine failed miserably, as you can see from this photo. No food would get in, people couldn't get out to work, uh, and eventually they just uh, rose up and rebelled and 
and force their way out. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we have to live with and deal with is the fact that quarantines have uh, some downsides and they have limited utility. Um, the latest um, hotspot is here uh, in Bunia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, where there's terror-induced chaos at the same time that health workers are trying to do things like vaccinate. Now, one of the things that new developments with regard to dealing with Ebola is the fact that we have a vaccine now that has proved pretty effective um, if we can get out and, and do it in time. <clears throat> so my fifth point here um, is, draws on chapter seven. <clears throat> and that chapter is called <clears throat> Climate Change, Health, and Migration. And it focuses on a rising global health challenge. Climate change is impacting health in a number of critical and expanding ways. The geographic spread of vectors, the connection of air polluting greenhouse gas emissions um, from fossil fuel combustion to serious negative health consequences, the spreading danger of heat related deaths, particularly in urban areas, increasingly destructive weather phenomenon, the potential for massive population dislocation and movement by climate migrants to health vulnerable sites due to sea level rise. That's on the horizon. Public health consequences in China, the world's largest greenhouse gas emission emitter, feature in, in my chapter discussion on climate change, health, and migration in chapter seven. But I want to briefly mention several prescriptions that I make in chapter seven. Uh, and I'm not shy about prescribing things when I feel uh, it's important to do so. So number one, along with self-interest, Earth's principal greenhouse gas emissions emitters have a moral responsibility for assisting climate migrants. If we're gonna keep up polluting and emitting these greenhouse gases that are causing climate change, then we have to be ready to accept the migrants that result from sea level rise and so forth. Um, adequate funding needs to be secured to ensure that relocation and other climate change adaptation measures will be addressed in an ethically responsible and healthy manner. We gotta do a lot of work here. Uh, we're not ready for this yet. Could be millions of people that are gonna be on the move as a result of sea level rise. One of the things about sea level rise is it tends to affect coastal communities that are, number one, heavily populated, and number two, have some of the uh, biggest investments in manufacturing and other kinds of economic activity. Um, secondly, second prescription, vigorous and immediate pursuit of pass to greenhouse gas curtailment must be understood as a public health priority. It's not just a climate change priority, it's a public health priority. And third, awareness raising is important. To attain effective behavioral change on the needed scale, reducing fossil fuel usage should be framed as an immediate personal and family health protecting measure. You protect your own self, your own family, when you engage in measures that are going to reduce fossil fuel usage. So I, I've picked this I thought this was maybe appropriate for Montana. It's sea level rise and farm fence posts, okay? So, but you know, I don't think we really have to worry about this in Montana, um, but some places do. And as I mentioned earlier, really the, the biggest danger is gonna be in coastal communities that are much more urbanized. Yeah. Do you think that, it'll, that we'll get ready? Um, I, I probably not, un, un, except I think what might happen is that there'll be one incident that will wake, that'll be a, a, a wake up call. So that first incident probably won't be ready for, but possibly after that we will. And the first incident affecting some northern country? So yes, mean, northern country or I think one of the most vulnerable countries, I'm, Bangladesh is obviously very vulnerable, but one of the most uh, vulnerable countries is China, one that is one of the biggest emitters at the same time. Uh, so it could be China as well. 
Okay, so now I want to move on to the second of my three fives, and that is cross-cutting and overlapping dynamics. Uh, and I got to be very brief here because there's so much I could say. Um, but first I would say that my starting point in terms of these cross-cutting dynamics um, may be a little different than the starting point of the President of the United States. My starting point basically is that people are going to continue to find safe and unsafe ways to traverse borders. Walls or no walls. Transmigration is going to grow. It's not going to diminish. Now if you look at this photo, this is uh, people crossing the Mediterranean, probably uh, reaching Greece. Um, can you see in the faces here and in the, in the uh, actions here, can you see the kind of desperation that these people are, 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 char are charged with and are expressing? And that kind of desperation is what drives migration today. That isn't going away. That's going to continue. People willing to risk their lives in situations like this. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's hard to empathize with that, but we have to think about that. We have to try to put ourselves in those shoes. Think about how you would feel. If, what, what drives you to try to risk your life to get to another place? How bad must that situation be? So we've got to try to address those situations that propel people to leave uh, rather than try to turn them away. And as long as we're not doing that, transmigration is going to continue to grow, not to diminish. So a couple, three other, four other things that I see as a cross-cutting and overlapping dynamic. Uh, second one is all five of the linkages that I discussed um, manifest the potential for enormous expansion. So they can all expand dramatically in the, in, the, in the future. Secondly, poverty and unequal mobility are tickets to the inequitable health care and long-term vulnerability that people face. In most northern countries, including the United States, uh, given the exclusions of the Affordable Care Act, legalization of immigration status is the principal determinant of timely access to quality, preventative, and curative care. And number four, in the Global South, health and development are severely disadvantaged by the outmigration of trained healthcare professionals. In comparison with African numbers, for instance, the United States averages about 12 times as many healthcare workers per 1,000 inhabitants. At the same time, more than half of all physicians trained in 11 southern countries that face serious workforce shortages practice in OECD countries, basically Europe, United States, and Japan. Number five, the analysis of health and migration connectors reveals that it is essential to address structural contributors to poverty and dislocation, along with migrant physical and mental health needs. So now I'll turn to my last slide. Um, and these are the take home messages for tomorrow's uh, public health professionals. First, let's start with the good news for you. Uh, and that is you can count on continuing rising demand for trained public health professionals broadly defined, including those who address the underlying contributors as well as the immediate challenges associated with dislocation and unequal health care. We'll need multiple fields of expertise and we'll need cross-cutting competence. Those things are going to be in demand. Meeting only the minimal threshold of health workers, which is set at 10,000 people, requires more than four the minimal threshold of 10,000, uh, sorry, let me say that again. Meeting the minimal threshold of health workers per 10,000 people requires more than 7 million additional physicians, nurses, and community health workers globally. And the shortfall is growing. The WHO in 2016 projected a need for 18 million additional health workers, primarily in low resource settings. Uh, by 2030, 
if the, contact, if the chronic shortfall is going to be uh, uh, addressed. In providing um, the broad range of health services necessary to uh, ensure that healthy lives exist for everyone, we need this kind of expansion of the number of people going into public health services broadly defined, not just doctors and nurses now, but people are working in logistics, people are working in uh, technology areas, people who are working in uh, sewer construction uh, and rebuilding some of those hospitals. Secondly, there's a deficiency in transnationally competent public health professionals that's even greater. So it's not, in my way of thinking, it's not enough to send out a lot of public health professionals if they don't have the transnational competency skills that are going to make them successful in the work that they do. And that brings me to my third um, take home point, which is there's an expanding and acute need for educating TC prepared public health professionals who are going to work with uh, dislocated professional persons. And so my next book, I intend to address this issue by uh, developing a curricula for professionals that, who are going to be serving both conflict displaced persons and climate displaced persons. Number four, the world needs future public health professionals who dedicate themselves to advancing health as a bridge to peace. And I find it encouraging in this regard that students of global health at certain universities are actually studying health as a bridge to peace. And I can mention several of those places for you. One is uh, Waterloo University in Canada. Uh, there's also students in Finland, Uganda, El Salvador, among other places that have been in the forefront of advocacy for peace through health. And finally, the conclusion to transnational mobility and global health elaborates my vision, vision of and a structural proposal for a global health and migration core, GHMC. Uh, it would be staffed by dedicated and transnationally pre competent, prepared youthful recruits, senior and mid-level professionals, and expanding diaspora professionals. I'm sorry, experienced diaspora professionals. The immediate objective of the Global Health and Migration Corps proposal is to employ mobility in a novel way that will effectively address the contemporary shortages in skilled healthcare workers that plague poor countries and underserved residents both in the South and in the North. Both treatment and health promotion needs would be addressed. And chapter eight, of my book elaborates on the GHMC in, in considerable detail. So let me make a uh, final take home specifically for University of Montana students um, who are here tonight. Uh, and that is, I believe that a forward looking step in the direction of the global health and migration core would be to minor in global public health at the University of Montana and complete the Peace Corps prep specialization in health that we are one of the few universities to be able to offer. Uh, so with that last plug, uh, I'll open it up to your questions. Thank you very much. Going to these places that you have been and witnessing and, and, and having a broader perspective on, on these kinds of needs, how do you recover? Like, how do you come back here and feel like, does it, does it take time for you to recover from those experiences? I guess maybe it's the first question to that. Um, let's see if I can pick somebody in the audience who can answer that question better than me. Uh, Haley. Um, yeah, it takes time to recover. Uh, I went to like Honduras with Medula Medical Aid and just did clinic health, and you get reverse culture shock when you come back, um, and you're 
like for example overwhelmed in the grocery store because there's too many choices and you get angry that you have so many choices when you've just been with in a place where nobody had any choices um, and so it takes time uh, and patience with yourself um, and it's a good idea to not make any rash decisions after you do that kind of traveling to working well <laughs> don't cut your hair don't quit your job <laughs> take time and do self-care because it is a little mind expanding all the travel experiences i've ever been on so yeah take so, time so let me ask you a follow-up to that it's a very good answer haley um and that is do you want to go back even more than you did when you first left after you've had that experience or do you say that's it <laughs> um i think that's i mean for me personally, um, all the traveling I do makes me want to travel more. Um, I know for other people that, for example, I, like I work at St. Pat's and a lot of them have done the Missoula Medical Aid Mission. Some of them are like, no, <laughs> I don't want to go back and do it again. That wasn't for me. It was too straining. I don't, that's not my passion and I don't want to do it anymore. For me, I, the more I get into it, the more I get into it. So I think that's, it's a question of, is this gonna be your passion? Do you have the capacity? Do you have, you know, what are the other obligations in your life? Um, so it's, it's, that's a very like individual consideration that you, you know, have to take seriously. That's a really good answer. And, and I think that's a question that you could very well ask each one of the people who are gonna give lectures uh, throughout the rest of this semester, because many of them I think you'll find are ready to go back. So, um, so it's not a one-off for most of them. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. Oh, here we go. Um, so as a potential future healthcare professional, I'm wondering how long do you think it would take for someone like myself to become transnet internationally competent uh, with your curriculum idea? How long do you think that would take? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so that's part of what my next book is going to look into and, and, and talk about in terms of the curriculum and how long that curriculum would take to, uh, to, to settle in. Um, you know, uh, my wife and I have taught a class on transnational competence for global leadership here. And we've done that class twice. Um, that's a one course, three credit course. Uh, for one full semester. Uh, I think students after that course had made considerable progress. Uh, I'm not sure that they would be, I would be ready to call them transnationally competent yet because I think the next step of that is to actually get out and practice. Um, but I think that, uh, you, that there's a lot that you can achieve uh, in, a, in a moving in that direction through, through study. Um, and then, and with good, but the other thing to remember is there are five different dimensions. Of I didn't have time to go into them. So it's not, I don't think you have to expect to be completely um, fluent or completely expert in all five of those different dimensions. So, and I think transnational competence is something that is a lifelong pursuit, okay? So you're not going to have to get there in order to be able to, to start. So I think that. Um, I don't have a fixed answer for you, uh, I think, but I think that with, with one good course under your belt and that kind of preparation, you should be able to move on from there. And then, of course, you know, transnational competence is just adding on to all the other things that you're doing, because you're also studying um, some dimension of global health, like maybe engineering or, or maybe uh, could be logistics or, um, uh, or sanitation, whatever it might be. So you've got that skill as well. So it's the combination of those skills that really matter. Uh, but then a lot of it is going to be being prepared to learn on the job, so to speak. Have enough preparation that you can go from there and, and lifelong learning. So it shouldn't, be a, it shouldn't stop you. Um, another question is, with that, do you think um, ideally that it should be added on as maybe a requirement for healthcare professionals to take some sort of international competency training or course? Um, absolutely. And uh, um, Dr. Herbert Schwick, who used to be the head of the Institute for Medicine and Humanities, and I 
actually uh, took on a project in that direction. So what we did is we got a grant uh, to offer a week-long seminar to uh, doctors who are educators at three universities in the United States to try to get them to introduce transnational competence into their curriculum. And so we also wrote about this in an article that's appeared in, in Academic Medicine, which you could look up or I could give you the source for. Um, uh, I, I believe absolutely that that should be a part of a medical school um, curriculum and also a nursing curriculum or any of the others. Uh, but I can say quite honestly to you that, um, as far as I know, nobody's done it yet. Um, so uh, it's a good idea, but uh, one of the arguments that people always make is that uh, the curriculum is too full already. Uh, that's, you can't add on anything to a medical school curriculum. Uh, so our pitch is you don't add on. You don't add on one single course. You just bring transnational competence education into all the other courses that uh, a doctor takes to get ready for their professional, professional credo, uh, credo, credentialing. So yes, I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of that. Thank you for asking me that question. Uh, yeah. Would you be so kind as to review again those five components? The five overlapping components? Yes, sure. Oh, the five components of TC, yes. yeah. So, sure, there's uh, analytic components, which basically involves the ability to learn, the ability to understand what the situation is that the person that you're working with, the patient, let's say, let's use patients here, it's easiest to, to, to understand. So what kind of a situation does that patient come from? What's their political background? What's their ethnic background? Um, what kind of education have they had? What's the education like? So it's, but you don't, the key thing here in analytic competence as we present it is not that you have to memorize all these things. You don't have to know all these things about every culture and every country in the world. You can't possibly do that. Nobody can do that. What you have to have is the skill to be able to learn it, to know where to go to find it, to know who to ask, uh, and to how to assess it when you've, when you've got there. So that's the analytic part, it's a, it's a, but it's a dynamic part. It's not a static memorization part. It's a, it's a learning part. And that's one way in which transnational competence is different from cultural competence because cultural competence often says what you need to do is learn about one culture and then you know everything but you don't because there's so many divisions within that one culture as a matter of fact that you have to uh, be willing to explore and to be able to understand so that's that's number one number two is the emotional competence emotional competence has a number of different dimensions but I think two of the most important ones are motivation that you have to be motivated uh, to serve. And the second is empathy, that you have to be able to empathize uh, with the patients that you're, that you're working with. So that's a really huge factor in terms of transnational competence, developing empathy. Doesn't mean you have to, empathy doesn't mean you have to agree. You don't have to say, yeah, that's the way I would do it too. But you have to understand, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, be able to feel it, be able to see it from their perspective. Um, the third dimension is um, uh, creative competence. And creative competence is the ability to kind of do a number of things. One is to link um, traditional medicine and, bio, uh, and biomedicine in terms of the different components of it and how you can bring those things together in a positive way rather than a way that contraindicates one another. Um, creative competence also, usually creative competence means bringing things together that haven't been brought together before in a unique way. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a lot of times that means at the very local level, trying to find some kind of a project that's going to work. It's kind of like what the Peace Corps does. When Peace Corps volunteers go out, they're often charged with trying to do something to help the village, but nobody tells them, here's what you're going to do. They come up with the, the idea themselves, and it's a very creative kind of thing oftentimes. So that's, what, that's the third dimension. The fourth dimension is communicative competence. And communicative competence involves both um, some, some degree of, of competence in the language of the person that you're dealing with, but not fluency. I, I've felt that you can't possibly, in today's world, when you're dealing with people from so many different backgrounds, and so many different countries and places, you can't possibly be expected to learn all those languages. But it helps if you learn a little bit, 
because then they appreciate the fact that you've made that effort. So what, what communicative competence really boils down to then is being able to use, um, to use interpreters um, and to know how to use interpreters effectively, what kind of interpreters you should use, try to avoid using family members, for example. Um, and also it means being able to use nonverbal communication styles, uh, which, uh, which are generic. Uh, so there's, but there's more to it, but that's kind of giving you some idea of what, and the last is functional competence. Functional competence basically involves a couple of things. One is trust, trust building. The first thing that you do in terms of functional competence is be able to establish a close personal relationship with the person you're working with. So this goes against all the things that doctors are doing these days when they're trying to push somebody out of their office in 10 minutes or less. Uh, it means taking the time to actually un identify with them as a person, with their family. Um, that kind of trust can open up all kinds of doors to being able to move together um, to develop things. So personal interest and personal ties and trust is first. And then the next thing after that is uh, being able to work together to accomplish some uh, mutually, mutually decided upon goals. And in that dimension of accomplishment or su successful execution of whatever it is you're trying to do, you bring together all the other dimensions of transnational competence. Because to succeed in that, you have to have analytic, communicative, emotional, and creative. And then the final part of it is this advocacy piece which really distinguishes transnational competence, I think, from most other models that are out there. It's not enough to just treat symptoms. You've got to try to get to the root causes and you've got to actually act on behalf of your patient. Now, that doesn't mean that you're gonna go out there and do everything for that patient, but you find the right referrals for that patient. And then you advocate for the, for the needs of those kinds of patients generically, um, like the, you know, the one, slide I showed you about Physicians for Social Responsibility actually taking part in street demonstrations, but there are other ways to do that. I mean, um, doctors and nurses and so forth have considerable political weight, and so if they are willing to use that on behalf of the needs of these people, there can be some successful addressing of the root causes rather than just the symptoms. Does that help? It's all in the book. It's all in the book. So make sure you sign in as many times as you can. Thank you. Uh, are you familiar with countries that are faced with severe public health challenges that have found ways to discourage the out-migration of the health professionals native to that country? Yes and no. I mean, there's, um, um, there, first of all, let's look at what the causes of out-migration are. Um, the first cause is uh, people can get much higher salaries if they move to the north. Um, the second cause often is they just don't have, doctors, let's say, for example, don't feel like they have the right facilities. They don't have the equipment that they need to be able to, to, to engage in their profession successfully uh, because they lack that kind of, those kind of resources. Um, a third factor that often leads to out-migration is, uh, is the family situation. Oftentimes, people want to leave because they want better opportunities for their kids, and they see the educational system as lacking in the country that they are, so they leave. Um, so, in fact, we see a lot more countries today that are encouraging out-migration than are trying to discourage out-migration. So the Philippines, for example, the government is specifically encouraging nurses to go abroad uh, because they see that they'll, bring, they'll then send back much more money in terms of remittances. And for a lot of countries, the remittances that come back are even greater than the foreign aid that they get. So the, this is something that they really try to encourage. Um, but what is happening is this. There's a new interest in return migration. And so we talk about migration today, and we have to think about it as in a whole. We have to think about it as really circular migration. And so what a lot of countries are trying to do, and international organizations are trying to help them in this, and some NGOs are involved in this as well, are trying to encourage people to come back. So you go abroad, um, you gain some expertise by working in a place where you've got all the equipment that you need, 
And then either you come back on a short term or you come back on a long term, or you even can help out remotely in, in terms of uh, telemedicine now. So that's where the real, the real changes are starting to occur now is in terms of return migration. And uh, many people um, are interested in that because they want to contribute to their homeland. Uh, they feel like they have an obligation to that homeland because a lot of their training occurred there. Um, maybe their kids have grown up now so that that's not as big an issue. So, you know, when I was in Ethiopia, I did meet people not in the health sector, but I met a number of people who had gone back to Ethiopia um, and, and, and decided that's where they wanted to end up their career. Um, of course, a lot, you have to also be careful because it gets a little more sticky if you've got uh, people who have left as refugees because of political persecution. If they left because of persecution, or if they've left because, like in the case of Syria, I can't remember now, the statistics are staggering in terms of the number of uh, health professionals in Syria who have fled the country. Almost nobody's left behind. Um, but until you resolve the conflicts or until you resolve the repression that led to uh, those people leaving, they're not going to go back. Uh, so, so in those cases, it's not going to happen as, as easily. But there's some real progress going on in that regard. And, and I like to think of that as, I like to think now of migration as not necessarily a loss, uh, short term maybe, but that it could in, in turn be a, be a net gainer in the long run. Yes? You just talked about um, solving those conflicts in those countries that caused those people to leave. But like in Syria, solving the conflict would most likely be war, which would destroy the country even further. So what, is there another solution to solving Syria's civil war crisis that's going on? Well, I, I can't say I'm an expert on, on Syria, but the, my general position is that the way you want to solve these crises is not by armed conflict. It's by peaceful negotiation. So that would be, and I think that what we need is we need to pressure the different sides to conflict to come together and resolve their conflicts in a peaceful way. It's, you know, obviously it's in their interest too, right? It's in everybody's interest. Um, and that's where I think people who are involved in public health can step up and play a greater role than they have in the past. Uh, and oftentimes they go to a place and they just, well, partly it's partly a matter of time. I mean, they're just so overwhelmed by the number of cases that they have to deal with that they don't have time to look at these other issues. But I think being in involved in the front lines, as I mentioned in my talk, in peaceful reconciliation, uh, in uh, post-reconstruction kinds of things to make sure that the conflict doesn't break out again, uh, in terms of actually being the front lines of negotiating, um, I think these are all roles that public health professionals should not shy away from any longer. Now, you know, it's not easy. I'm, I'm not trying to pretend that it's easy uh, because these conflicts have deep roots. Um, but we know that it can, they can be overcome and we, we, there are places where it's been successful. Um, look at Ireland, for example. Uh, so you can do it. Um, uh, it doesn't have to go on from generation to generation. Um, so uh, that's, where I, that's where I like to see the, I, I'm not advocating for military solutions to, to bring about peace. And you know, you could take that same lesson and apply it to Afghanistan. Um, and um, it's you know, easier to say than to do. Uh, but I think there's a lot more that public health professionals can, can do than they have done in the past. We have some more prescriptions about um, what what we are obligated to as a, whatever members of the global community, and one of those ways that you were saying is is to have doctors and medical professionals be advocates, like on a local level or like bolstering international law. Like, how would you see some of that advocacy panning out? Like, in, in which forums would that be the most effective? That's, that's a really good question, and I think the answer is all of the above. Um, <clears throat> but 
any one individual is not likely to be able to have the expertise, the context, and the time to work on all of those levels. So I think that each individual has to decide for himself or herself where they can play the most impactful role. Is it at the local level, like you know, out in the conflict situation where we're just talking about? Uh, is it at the national level in terms of national policy, or is it at the international level? So I think that, you know, to me, um, I don't expect people to act on all three of those levels at the same time, but um, I would like to think that people would f would find their role in one of those at least. Yeah. Uh, sort of a personal community question. You have a variety of speakers coming in and have in years past. Do you think Missoula is unique in terms of its health professional community in terms of the outreach that they do globally? I just saw a physician this week. He, I told him where I was going. He said he was going to Costa Rica to devote some time during his, quotes, vacation. And if, if that's true, and I, I have a sense it is, what makes Missoula uh, more empathetic, uh, more globally oriented than, say, uh, another community? Well, you got me on that question. Um, I, I do think that, uh, that we are special. Uh, I mean, just look at, this is what, year six now, I think, of the lecture series? And, and we've had a few duplications, but mostly not. So you multiply six times 15 or six times 14, and that's how many people, not all of them are from Missoula, of course. They're increasingly, we've been getting people from outside of Missoula. But, you know, that's an, on a per capita basis, that's pretty amazing. And these are people who have done really awesome stuff. I mean, it's not little stuff. They've done amazing things. Um, so I don't know about other places. I mean, I can't speak about other places, but it just seems to me like Missoula is pretty special in this regard. Now, why? That's the one I don't know how to answer. I mean, is it because we are so insular here? Because we're not um, on a coastal, in a coastal urban environment where we have a lot more of these kinds of things? Or maybe is it something about the nature of Missoula that attracts people who are um, basically committed to this kind of thing? I mean, is it, uh, we know that we know that doctors, a lot of doctors come to Missoula because they like the environment, right? They like to go skiing and they like the mountains and all that. Maybe, they, maybe those kind of people are also the kinds of people who like to give back to people in other countries. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's a fascinating one. Uh, and maybe we should try to uh, explore that by doing a survey or something like that. Contrast Missoula, say, with the, the, that city yeah, that other one, that other one. no other one begins with a B? Yeah, I can't, I'm not being facetious, but, but contrasting what, you know, what happens. I, I'm particularly amazed by the health professionals. I see dentists and neurologists and heart specialists and, right. and eye, uh, surgeons. eye surgeons, there you go, uh, who, you know, devote time, not, not just a singular visit, but a, a, a steady uh, outpouring. And, and I'm encouraged to see all the young people here who are following in that path. Well, and you know, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to have this lecture series, because I felt that, and I got to thank MCAT for this too, because they've been so supportive and were able to reach so many more people because of the fact that they videotaped these lectures as well. But I, I felt that we need to showcase, we need to recognize the people that we've got here who are doing this kind of thing, because it's a, it, Basically, it's a quiet, it's a hidden story, um, except when they come and give one of these lectures. Um, so, uh, you know, encourage your friend who went to Costa Rica to get in touch with I me will. Will. Uh, because we'll, we'll line him up for next year. We've already got, how many, Kelly, do you think we have ready to go for next year that are interested? Six yeah. Uh, we, right, so we've already got a number of people that have shown interest in next year already. Uh, and, you know, it's just such a thrill for me to be able to meet these people and to learn about the wonderful things that they do. And so I, I'm, and I thank all of you for coming tonight and hope that you will also um, come and hear the rest of the speakers that we've got in this, in this incredible lineup for, for the rest of the semester. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>